Hello everyone! Today we are back to our World of Dragons, where all creatures that fall under that umbrella term have evolved alongside humanity. And what better time than Smogost to have a look at the last big clade of dragons in this world, the New World Feathered Serpents. If you are new to this series, please consider watching the rest for context. And now, without further ado, let's get started! While we've met a lot of different dragons in this world, most of them have shared the same habitats in the old world. Now, let us meet the New World family of dragons, most well known by the species known as Pena Serpens viridicrista, or Quetzalcoatl, which we will see illustrated today. Family Coatlinide is a group that diverged from the Asian flying serpent after some small populations migrated eastwards towards the American continent in modern times inhabiting the hot and temperate areas of Mexico, the USA, and the southernmost parts of Canada. This clade has greatly benefited from the absence of other flying dragons in their environment. Aside from a few sea serpents that have readapted to land, family Quatlinidae are the only dragons in the New World. The absence of any competitors or potential predators has allowed them to become much more specialized in their niche with their limbs becoming even more reduced and improving their aerial locomotion. Lacking the strong limbs other dragons use to take off, these serpents will simply call their bodies and whip themselves in an upwards motion, with their flotation sacs keeping them aloft afterwards. Due to their geographic isolation, as well as their distribution being much less interconnected compared to that of Asian Celodraconis, they present much greater interspecies variation, with their coloration ranging from green and turquoise to gold and red. They also present a high degree of sexual dimorphism, and the lack of predators has allowed males to focus on sexual selection and develop impressive, incredibly ornate bodies, with the loss of speed and maneuverability not really affecting them that much compared to the benefits it brings. The most common of these ornaments is a series of frills and crests located around the head and neck, readapted from the feathers of their ancestors, although these are also found in smaller quantities across the rest of the body. Other common mating displays include nasal ornaments, most prominently seen in species like the Olmec dragon, as well as complex dances intended to boast the male's strength. Like most dragons, these flying serpents are carnivores. They usually have rather large hunting territories, and prey on a wide variety of prey, most usually medium-sized mammals they will catch in their mouth as they dive from the heights. Unfortunately, this will sometimes include humans, and in some cases, local towns have taken to offering human sacrifices in order to sate their hunger. This would end up having the opposite effect leading to these dragons associating humans with food, making future attacks more likely and eventually causing the abandonment of this practice. There are, however, little to no records of today's species ever attacking human beings. Being one of the largest species of Quatlinida, it is likely the Quetzalcoatl simply does not see humans as prey, looking instead for larger herbivores that evolved to resist attacks from smaller serpents. The Quetzalcoatl is, in fact, rather relaxed and curious, as is the case with larger animals that live near human settlements, and the locals, having learned not to fear it, have instead taken to tying it to their own religions and myths, with the serpent sharing the name of one of the Aztec gods. And that's it for speculative biology look into Quetzalcoatl. Now, as with some earlier episodes, I've discussed the absurdness inherent in classifying all of these beings as dragons. But as always, people gonna people. And no shortage of Native American, Mesoamerican, and South American creatures have been classified as dragons in the past, being large and mighty reptiles and everything. So it got a pass for this series. And I just wanted to draw Quetzalcoatl in this style, so I had to go for it. 
Now, I know from the comments that many expected this being to be an amphitheater or winged dragon. But unlike the drawings you may have seen on the web, the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl's snake form, was never depicted as having wings by the people who believed in it, only showing it as a giant, highly ornate snake. Hence the model I went with. And while the main clades are over, I will still make some videos in the future to show other smaller clades and species, as well as how other animals and plants evolved alongside dragons, or even how human culture changed and adapted as a result. So please let me know if you'd be interested in seeing something like that. As always, here's a big thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode. And it was really fun to draw and conceptualize, so thank you for commenting. And also thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support our channel. And you get some nice perks too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe, or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the Speckivo treatment in the show. Any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.